Madness. Top 10 Tuesday. Here's my top recommendations for the Silver Age of horror films. The Silver Age, to me, spans the 50s and 60s. There's a lot of different genres that overlap here, so it's a bit complicated to nail down without two separate videos. This was the Atomic Age, so the horror genre almost went away during the 50s and instead adapted itself to the fear of nuclear devastation and the idea of scientific advancements that dare to go too far. The horrors of this time were either created in a lab or came from outer space to kill us all. Horror overlaps with science fiction, so this can get confusing. I'm breaking it up between the sci-fi films of the 50s and the horror movies of the 60s, which will also include the Hammer films. Hammer is when the genre got back to traditional horror, but since the Hammer films began in the late 50s, they would have been included here, but for now, we're talking sci-fi. This also means some of the great Vincent Price classics like House of Wax and House on Haunted Hill aren't going to make the cut. Can't forget about those, but they don't fit in here. So anyway, next time, we'll get to the 60s and all of Hammer. So now, on to the 50s. And even here, I feel the need to divide it into three parts. Three separate top fives. Fifteen total. Five for each subgenre. Alien invaders, monsters on the loose, and scientific disasters. Got it? So, okay. First up, top five alien invaders. Honorable mention goes to Ed Wood's Plan 9 from Outer Space, where aliens raise the dead. I can't call it one of the best because it's so well known for being bad, but it's so entertaining. It's full of memorable quotes and blunders. It's best enjoyed on repeat viewings. It was also very inspirational to me in my teen years because Ed Wood didn't have a huge Hollywood budget, yet he tried to do it anyway. It shows ambition and passion above all technicalities. To fully understand its cult appeal, I highly recommend the documentary Flying Saucers Over Hollywood, The Plan 9 Companion. Number five, Earth versus the Flying Saucers. As far as your typical aliens come down and try to destroy everything scenario goes, this is the prime example. The characters are bland, but the Ray Harryhausen special effects are the real star. It's a feast to the eyes. Seeing these saucers blasting buildings, it's awesome. The final sequence where they attack Washington, D.C. is so iconic that it was somewhat remade with Independence Day 40 years later. Number four. Invasion of the Body Snatchers. The concept is still the same. The aliens come down to take over the Earth, but this is less action-oriented and a bit smarter. Here, the aliens take over human likenesses in a very sophisticated attempt at replacing us. The idea that your friend might be an extraterrestrial was a scary concept that really caught on with audiences. Number three, The Thing from Another World. It's sadly overshadowed by the John Carpenter remake, which is great in its own way, but this one is less about special effects and more about suspense and innovative for its overlapping dialogue, a trademark of Howard Hawks' films. This could also be viewed as a Monster on the Loose film, but it begins as a scientific study of an extraterrestrial shipwreck, and there's a large emphasis on the fact that it's a being from another world, and the debate whether we can communicate with it or not, and you can't forget the final chilling line, watch the skies. Number two, the day the Earth stood still. This is the only one on the list where the alien is not trying to kill us, but to deliver a message to save us from destroying ourselves. It has all the great cheesy things that you'd want to see, like a glowing saucer-shaped ship, a laser-shooting robot named Gort, but that's all surface stuff. To know why it's such a masterpiece, you just gotta see it. It's debatable for the number one spot. Number one. War of the Worlds. This is the best of the hostile kind of aliens. It's based on the H.G. Wells novel. This is way ahead of its time with color cinematography and with special effects and sound design that are on par with Star Wars. For 1953, it is incredible. The look of the spaceships is totally unique, not the stereotypical saucer shape. The laser sounds are some of the best sound effects ever, and the magnitude of the destruction caused by the aliens has never 
never been more ominous. It's depicted as a full-on disaster, a battle that humanity can't win. None of these movies ever got the Monster Madness treatment, but that was because I covered all of them in a three-part series where I compared classic Alien Invader movies with their remakes. Look up Alien Invaders on Cinemassacre.com. Now, top five monsters on the loose. This is any movie where there's a monster going around terrorizing people and not necessarily giant sized. Because there's so many, I have to give an honorable mention to Rodan and 20 Million Miles to Earth, which overlaps with the Alien Invader genre, though that would never exclude it from either list. The monster can still be from space. Number five, them. Giant killer ants. There were tons of giant insects in the 50s, but this is the best of the bunch. It doesn't mean giant ants are any more cool than giant grasshoppers or spiders. In fact, I almost picked tarantula, but this is the most well-made of them all. It must have been an inspiration for James Cameron's Aliens. We have a young girl who's traumatized after her parents were killed. There's soldiers in dark caves going around with flamethrowers fighting the ants. And at the end, in a secret chamber, there's a queen ant laying eggs. So you can see all the similarities to aliens. Number four, the beast from 20,000 fathoms. Nuclear bombs awaken a hibernating creature in the Arctic. It heads for New York City and destroys everything. The best part is the Ray Harryhausen special effects. The stop motion animation is truly amazing. There's lots of detail going into it. For example, when the monster goes between buildings, he comes in and out of shadows. It's one great shot after another, a visual masterpiece and it predates Godzilla, making it the original giant prehistoric reptile rampage. Number three, the blob. This is a monster that happened to come from space, but is mainly a monster on the loose film. What a great idea for a monster, a massive slime that sticks to people, devouring them and growing bigger. It's such a scary idea that it could ooze underneath a door or come through a drainage pipe. No matter where you go, you're not safe. The special effects are very low budget and makeshift. That's another thing appealing about it, that it's not a Hollywood film. It was made in Pennsylvania. But it's not about the effects, it's about the characters. The teenagers are the heroes in the movie, which was uncommon at the time. They're very likable, especially the star, Steve McQueen. There's lots of prank playing and jokes, but in the end, they all get together to save the town. I love how obvious it is as a product of the decade in which it was made. It's a great little window into the 50s. Number two, Creature from the Black Lagoon. This is often considered the last of the classic Universal monsters, with the creature, the Gill Man, always being grouped into that same monster family. It's shot in 3D, with lots of great underwater scenes. It's beautiful to look at. Who's to say monster movies have to always be dark and gloomy? It does have its dark, creepy moments, but all the outdoor scenery is gorgeous. The Gill Man suit is one of the best of its kind. He's a sympathetic creature. After all, they came into his home. His romantic attachment to a girl is similar to King Kong, but the film has a legacy of its own, with the main cast on a boat hunting a monster and a woman swimming with something watching her from underneath the water. It's clearly an inspiration for Jaws. And the number one monster on the loose film? Godzilla. There's probably no giant monster that has spawned more sequels and imitators than this. Even though it owes itself to Beast from 20,000 Fathoms, this is the one that started the whole genre of kaiju. The original Godzilla was very serious. He was a symbol of nuclear war from a country that firsthand experienced its devastating effects. But modern people today remember Godzilla for the cheesy moments that came later. This treats the monster as a terrifying disaster. This has to make number one. After all, he is the king of the monsters. And at last, top five scientific disasters. This is sort of a looser, miscellaneous category. There could be a monster in it, but not necessarily. The only requirement is that whatever the problem is, it has to be caused by some kind of scientific explanation. It could be a lab experiment gone wrong or any kind of unnatural disaster. Number five, 
The Tingler. Vincent Price plays a doctor who discovers that the spine-tingling feeling you get when you're scared is actually a creature growing in your back that feeds on your fear. The only thing that keeps it subdued is when you scream. But what if you didn't scream? He tries an experiment on a mute woman who can't scream by giving her an acid trip in a bizarre scene with some color effects. The rest of the film is black and white. And out of her back comes The Tingler. It's probably the greatest of the William Castle movies. This is the movie where he put buzzers in the theater seats to emulate the feeling of The Tingler. And there's a blackout moment where they encourage the audiences to scream. It would have been fun to see it in a theater back then, but it's still very very enjoyable. It's cheesy in all the right ways. Number four, Fiend Without a Face. A scientist conducts an experiment on brain power. He wants to find a way to move things with his mind, but ends up creating a living being out of pure thought. It's a bunch of invisible brains that suck people's blood and turn them into zombies. Wow. You never get to see the brains until the very end when a nuclear overload makes them visible, but when you do see them, it's great. The brains crawl about with their spinal cord tails with a combination of stop motion and puppet work. The last scene is amazing where a group of people are trapped in a house and fight the brains by shooting or stabbing them. And each time you see the blood bubbling out of the dead brains and it lingers on it with the sound effects like This is the only movie of the 50s where you can see a brain getting smashed with an axe. This must have been the goriest film of its time. How did this get released? Number three, The Fly. Yes, there is an original The Fly, about a scientist who invents a teleportation unit but accidentally switches molecules with a fly. Everybody knows the Cronenberg remake from the 80s starring Jeff Goldblum, which was also great, but lots of people dismiss the original, which is very sad to me. The original is a true classic, but I can see why somebody would see the remake first, which is more in tune with modern sensibilities, and be spoiled by it, spoiled by the superior special effects, spoiled by Jeff Goldblum, and then go back to the original and not care for it. That's a shame. I was fortunate to have seen the original first, but I saw the remake almost immediately afterwards, and to me, seeing them both fresh back to back, I think the original tells the story best without much special effects. Number two, Forbidden Planet. Dr. Morbius, the last survivor of a scientific expedition to a distant planet, creates a machine that can materialize anything he can imagine, but he doesn't realize his subconscious mind creates an invisible monster that goes on a rampage, a projection of his evil inner self. This is one of the first movies to take place entirely on a planet other than Earth. It has one of the most famous robots of all time, Robbie. Even if you haven't seen the movie, you've seen that robot. This is in no way a cheesy B-movie. This is top of the line. Big budget, color, widescreen, well-written, and very sophisticated. It's a masterpiece so influential to the sci-fi genre that you would have never had Star Trek without it. Not to mention, it stars Leslie Nielsen before he was famous for comedy. And number one. The Incredible Shrinking Man. This is the only movie that can top all that. It's about a man who's exposed to a mysterious radiation at sea and slowly starts to shrink in size. It happens gradually throughout the course of the film, so you get the chance to know the character and care about what's happening to him. By the time he's tiny, every typical household thing is a danger to him, such as the cat and a spider. There were other movies made about tiny people before, like Dr. Cyclops, but this is the first one to turn a normal house into an adventure. It was clearly a big inspiration for Honey, I Shrunk the Kids. What makes the movie great is how tragic it feels. With no scientific cure for him, his situation just keeps getting worse and worse. It's an idea that could have been gimmicky, but it's so well executed. So check in next Tuesday. We'll finish up The Silver Age with the horror films of the 60s and Hammer. Hammer.